Hello and welcome to Straight Talk with Arun Kumar. Today's topic is about upcoming U.S. elections. And our guest tonight is Hector Oseguera. Hector is a Democratic congressional primary candidate for District 8 in the state of New Jersey. Hello, Hector. Hey, thank how you are for you? having me on. I'm great. How was the traffic today? Oh, very light. Very for light. A Saturday afternoon, not bad at all. Not bad. No. So, how's your campaign going? It's going really well, I would say. Uh, we just had our second Jersey City uh, meet and greet last night. Tremendous turnout. We had about 30, 40 people in a house yesterday. The you know the energy in the community has really been tremendous. People are really excited because they're not really used to having primary challengers for the Democrats. The Democrats usually run unopposed, yeah. especially in Hudson County. So mm -hmm. people are really excited to have somebody out in the community listening to their concerns, asking them what they care about, and you know, giving them a choice this year. So which other counties fall in your district? Bergen, Union? No, it's Hudson County, mostly Hudson County. Um, there's a part in Union County and Essex County. So the easiest way to describe my district is that it's the Hispanic gerrymander. Yep. So it, it's basically all the Hispanic towns. Uh, the town in Union County is Elizabeth. That's cut into my district because it's got a lot of Hispanic people. Yep. And then um, Jersey City and Newark are literally cut in half between the predominantly black sections and the predominantly Hispanic sections with the Hispanic sections sitting in my district. So about 55% Hispanic, you'd say? Yeah, 54, last time 54. I checked. 54.5, yeah, yeah. yeah. So are you Hispanic? Probably? Yeah, uh, I'm of Dominican and Honduran descent. My mother came here from the Dominican Republic. My father came here from Honduras when he, both of them were in their teenage years. So yeah, you know, it's essentially the story of my district, you know, Previously, it was a very high Cuban population, and the Cuban population has really put down a lot of roots throughout my district, especially in West New York and Union City. But over the 70s and 80s and 90s, it was a lot more uh, people from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and people from Central America who came into my district, and here I am. I like that. It's not Puerto Rico. It's Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. I like that. So Osa Guerra, I got that right, right? Absolutely, you did. Okay. So do you think this racial mix is going to help you? Absolutely. You know, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, voters all want the same thing, right? Yep. Especially in a district like mine, which is predominantly working class district. No matter whether your family came to my district through Ellis Island or through Newark Airport, you came here for the same reason. You want an opportunity. You want to work hard. You want to live that American dream. And for so long, we've been electing Democrats who have not really done a good job of speaking to the working class concerns of my district. So I really think that, yes, obviously being Hispanic in a predominantly Hispanic district definitely helps because the community feels comfortable with me to a certain extent. The fact that I'm Dominican speaks to the experience that a lot of people in my district have. But at the end of the day, whether you're Hispanic, black, white, Indian, no matter what racial group you might fall into, I think that voters at the end of the day, they all want the same thing. Still, your district is spectacular. It's about 65% to 70% non-white population. Yeah, it's a very, very <laughs> diverse population. Very diverse, you know? yeah. and, and I think that that's a reflection of where our country is really going, you know. It's a, it's a melting pot. We all come and we mix with one another. My girlfriend's Filipino. You know, every, we come here not really looking to segregate ourselves or segregate each yep. other. We just want to mix. Like I said, we all want the same thing. So people find common ground and they will mix with each other. They'll come to find that, you know, even if I'm Hispanic and you're Indian, we get into a conversation. We actually have a lot of common ground and we all really want the same things out of life. So who's Hector? What's your profession? What's your occupation? What do you do? So I work, uh, I'm an attorney. I work as an anti-money laundering analyst. So what I do is I review financial activity. Because the United States dollar is the reserve currency of the global economy, yep. any international wire will come through. Through US dollars. Through a US dollar bank, yes. Yeah. So what I do is I review international wires, not exclusively international, some can be domestic, but predominantly domestic wires uh, or international wires, and I will review them for money laundering activity. So I will perform due diligence on the parties involved in those wires, and I will try to determine whether or not that's suspicious or not. And if it is, it could go to an investigation and ultimately end up with what the Treasury Department calls a suspicious activity report. 
which goes directly to the Treasury Department's the Financial Crime uh, Enforcement Network, and they will do the law enforcement work of tracking down who was behind that activity. So from money laundering expertise, anti-money laundering expertise to politics, how come the switch? Well, um, you're not going to make a lot of headlines talking about political corruption in New Jersey. And one of the overarching themes of my campaign is anti-corruption. And so my career gave me the tools to ferret out and to shine a light upon corrupt or illicit activity that was going on in the financial sector, but is also going on in our political lives in Hudson County. You have a lot of, uh, unfortunately, corrupt officials who are either taking bribes or engaged in unsavory activity. And while I was doing that work in the financial sector, I thought, you know, why not bring it to the public sector and see what I could do for the everyday voter? Why that district? It's where I live. It's where I grew up. I was born in Hoboken. I was raised in West New York. Oh, you're from that? I, yeah, I was district. literally born and raised wow. in my district. I've lived there my entire life. The only time I've never uh, stayed there permanently is when I was in college. I was up in college in Boston and law school in Boston, but my entire life I've maintained an address in the district. It's my home. It's the place I feel comfortable. Fair enough. Yeah. Why House, not, not the Senate? Well, um, honestly, my opponent is somebody that I'm very familiar with. He was my hometown mayor. Um, Albios? Yeah, Albios Cires. He was uh, the mayor of West New York when I was a child. And for a long time, you know, in New Jersey, we elect a lot of Democrats. It's a very blue state. Yep. And I think one of the unintended consequences of Trump's election is that a lot of voters sort of woke up and started saying, you know, who am I electing to Congress? Who is my congressman? Who is my official? And the more I looked into my opponent, the less I liked. And I came to find out that in uh, 2018, he didn't even have a primary challenger. So I felt that given the job that he's doing, I didn't want to let this election season go by without somebody really putting the fire to his feet and you know trying to hold him accountable for the good or bad job that he's been doing in our district. So essentially, the w I just I never really thought I would be running for office. This is not, I've never run for office before. This is not something that was in my plans. I just started to in, uh, look into my local politician, felt that he was not doing a good job, and that he deserved somebody to challenge his position. What's more on his side, the good or the bad? Definitely the bad. I mean, he's... Why? Because you're running against him? That, you know, th that's clear, but no, I can give you so many examples. He's never in the district. Okay. He's not in the district right now. I can almost guarantee you that he's in Florida playing golf at this very moment. Um, he's ve for even for a politician, he's hyper unresponsive. Uh, if you try to get in touch with him, people have referred to it as a Kafkaesque novel, where his office will say, "Sure, I can take your call. I, I, I I'll be happy to meet with you," and then they'll blow you off. He's hyper unresponsive. The issues that he fights for, he's very pro-ICE in a majority Hispanic district. So one of the uh, incidents that made me decide that to could take go on, against him. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that made me take on this fight is that a group of activists went to his office and asked, you know, not will you abolish ICE, right? They just asked, will you at least rein in the spending that is going to ICE until we get these detention centers under control? Mm -hmm. And a member of his staff said. He will absolutely never vote to cut a penny from ICE. He says ICE does great work. And, you know, that's not something that a majority of the people in our district are going to agree with, especially in times like these when uh, we're seeing a militarized immigration force. You know, in my opinion, uh, immigration should be a civil matter, not a criminal matter. Immigration should not have men in uh, battle armor, in tanks, performing well, raids. Let me ask, yeah, let me ask you this question. Sure. ICE is a federal... Agency, right? Yeah. Why not just you? Sure. I mean, in general, uh, some Americans, especially the liberal uh, parties, yeah. why are they against an American uh, authority or American officials? They're doing their duty. Okay, it's not against those officials themselves. It's about the policy that is enacting what we see as human rights abuses. Uh, if you'll remember the story of Elian Gonzalez, right? Uh, a child who came here from Cuba and who was ripped from his family's arms in their own home in Florida. 
That same unit that ripped Elian Gonzalez from his uncle's arms are the same units that Trump has now given guns, tanks, and body armor to and told to raid communities like mine. There's nothing wrong with officials. A police officer is supposed to do their job. But part of that job is doing it in a humane and in a legitimate way because in a democracy, the federal government gets its authority from the consent of the people. So when you see policy being enacted that is counter to the desires and the values of the people who live in the country, that's a very legitimate, uh, uh, I think, line of attack to say, listen, there's nothing wrong with the people who want to work in ICE. I'm sure everybody who goes into the police force wants to do the right thing. They want to uh, be a law enforcement person. They want to protect the community. But the way that it's done is very important. But I believe there's a statute, the federal statute, which lays this as a criminal offense, no? Um, okay, yeah. I do not remember the code, but I, I, I strongly believe there is a statute which there, calls this a, a criminal offense. Okay, I mean, I would have to look up the specific law itself, but even still, having a disagreement with that law itself is our line of attack that I should, number one, ICE should not be within the Department of Homeland Security. It should be within the Justice Department like it was back in the INS days because immigration is not something that should involve men in body armors. It should not involve guns and tanks and raids. That's inhumane. That's really abusive to people who come to this country looking for an opportunity and are being taken advantage of by their employers who hire undocumented people so that they don't have to pay the wages that they're supposed to legally be paying. So who are we going after? Are we going after the vulnerable, the people who have no power? Or why aren't we going after the people who hire undocumented people right. who are abusing our system? I'm going to push you a little bit sure. here. So if you have open borders and if you if you do not take the uh, the immigration, illegal immigration seriously, uh, you do not know who these people are, right? They're not vetted. Uh, you know, for all you know, they could be a threat to society. Do you agree or disagree? Of course I agree, but let me, let me push back to you. Who's for open borders? Right. I'm not for open borders. Right. Nobody in the Democratic Party is for open borders. This is sort of a talk point. Um, well, most of the Democratic uh, candidates, sure. uh, or the supporters, I should say, are against building a wall. Absolutely. Against, against having a closed borders. So should we, well, not, should we not protect our own borders? Number one, a wall is not a closed I mean, and, and I absolutely am against a it's closed a, it's border. It's discouraging uh, open border, at least. No, not at all. It's not. Uh, a wall is, has nothing to do with immigration policy. Let me, let me just get that off the bat. A wall is a racist idea that says, it's, it's medieval, and it says, this is us, and that's them. That's what the wall is about. The wall has nothing to do with immigration That's okay, policy. because it's us, meaning us Americans, and it's them. Them meaning non-Americans. Why do you treat it as a racial issue? It's no. them is non-Americans. That could be white Canadians. It could ah, be... It could but, be. But why is there not a wall going up on the northern border? Then? Because I believe there's not as much illegal immigration from the northern border as there is from the southern border. That's not true. That's not true? No, there's not. Okay. There's you see, that's the thing. And when we get into uh, these talking points, we have to, you know, work off facts, right? That's what we're going on. Sure. So a wall it will do nothing to curb illegal immigration. We should get that off the bat because most of the people who come here undocumented come on a boat or on a plane and overstay a visa. That is 60% of the undocumented people in our country come on a plane or on a boat and overstay a visa. The idea of the caravan that people like Trump like to talk about, that's not what uh, illegal immigration, that's not what undocumented people coming to our country looks like. The wall is really, it is a racial idea because there's no wall going up on the, on the Canadian side. And that's not, that's something that if you spoke to a Trump supporter about, they would say, no, of course we're not putting a wall so on you, the Canadian So you're border. saying you, if, if Trump or any president sure. agrees to put a wall on the northern border, you have no problem no, I, I don't th want th them putting period. a wall on the southern border? No, I don't want a wall, period. Th this is not a, th we're not, we don't live in So then, th then you suggest a, 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 a regulated or a con much more controlled way of controlling the illegal immigration, if not Absolutely. a wall? Absolutely. You know, we're in the 21st century, right? Mm -hmm. We're not in 1400. A, a wall with armed guards at the top holding sticks, you know, that's not, that's not where we live. Of course there should be security. Of course there should be checkpoints. Of course we should have a system that checks who's coming in. Obviously, you don't just let anybody into your home, right? You check who's coming in and then you say yes or no. 
And of course, we can have a legitimate, a functioning immigration system that is not inhumane, that is not, you know, a disgrace to the international community the way Trump's immigration policy is an absolute disgrace to our nation. So let's talk about a congressional district now. Let's sure. switch gears a little bit. So you said people are kind of vexed or fed up with Albios. Absolutely. Right? Then how come his, he got elected like four straight terms? Wonderful question, right? In Hudson County, in, Jer in Jersey, we refer to the establishment as the machine, right? The way that the machine continues to perpetuate itself is it does two things. Number one, it relies on hyper low turnout hyper low turnout. So my opponent has absolutely no presence in the district. When I go knocking door to door, one of the first questions that I ask the average person is, do you know the name of your congressman? And I'm at an 80-20 split. 80% 80 of the people I talk to have no idea who he is. So who is voting, right? Um, the machine uh, threatens and extorts public service employees. If you're a school teacher, if you're a crossing guard, if you're a police officer or a firefighter. Uni or union or? And not, not exactly union, just a public sector worker, okay. public sector worker in my district. Every year, someone will come to you and they will say, you have to go to this gala. You have to donate to your local politician, like my opponent. You have to go door to door and canvas for your local politician. And if you don't, you won't have a job next year. When I first launched this campaign, oh, threatening. absolutely. When I first launched this campaign, I spoke to one of my teachers and he says to me, Hector, <coughs> you're a wonderful guy. I know who you are. I've known you since you were a child. You would make a great congressman. If I were to ever say something to support you, I would have to go dumpster diving to feed my children. Because every time there's an election, they extort public service employees to donate to work for, you see, I have to go, I have to do this the legitimate way. I have to ask people to volunteer for me. I have to ask people to donate to my campaign. People who donate to this campaign do so because they believe in what we're fighting for. People who donate to my opponent do so under the threat that they might not have a job next year. And a lot of the people in that system are sick of it themselves, and they don't want to participate in the system. You would not believe, if I showed you my DMs on Facebook, how many people come to me and say, I was threatened, my job was threatened if I didn't donate to them, if I didn't go to this gala, if I didn't go door to door knocking for my opponent. So they rely on hyper low turnout, but then to threaten a very reliable, group of voters to turn out for them, thereby projecting strength that's not really there. Your situation is funny. Uh, normally, a uh, case for the candidate is primary is half the battle, right? And the rest of the battles is, is general elections. Yeah. In your case, I, I think uh, uh, primary is a full battle. Absolutely. Uh, it's pretty much a blue, uh, blue district. Uh, very blue. P plus 27. Guaranteed. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The, I think the Cook Report, right? Yeah, the Cook Report is a it's plus 27 Democratic Yeah, exactly. District. So it's, it's solid Democratic, in other words, yep. um, per their report. So how do you uh, plan to fight this battle of the primary, which is pretty much equals, the primary equals general in your yeah, case? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, yeah, the way that we fight this is actually not as difficult as it would seem because I have a presence in my district. I just had a meet and greet last night. We're holding events. I have three different groups of people going door to door right now. You're a native. Yeah, I know the district. I know it like the back of my hand. I'm very familiar with the community, with the people who live there, and I'm having a presence and people are very excited to have a choice this year. People are not excited to vote for my opponent. Nobody's excited to vote for my opponent, even the people who vote for him regularly, which would have included me at a certain time, you know? For a long time, I was going to the polls, voting Democrat all the, all the time, thinking I was doing the right thing until the 2016 election, and I decided to open my eyes. And I'm not the only one. There's a tremendous amount of energy building in my district, and I don't think that this machine is as powerful as they project or as powerful as they would like to think that they are. There is tremendous appetite for change. Would Trump factor, positive or negative, uh, would have any impact on your, on you or, or the existing incumbent's um, chances? In a way, you know, I like to say not really, uh, because that's a little bit, uh, you know, Trump's not very popular in my district. Exactly. You, you, you know, but, I, I would understand. But 
My opponent votes regularly for Trump's military budgets. My opponent voted to extend the warrantless wiretapping program in the Patriot Act. My opponent, uh, on last val not this Valentine's Day that just passed, a year before that, took a picture with a man named Elliot Abrams, who is Trump's ambassador to uh, in overthrowing the government of Venezuela right now. And so my opponent is not that different from the from the Republican side on a lot of issues. And so to the extent that Trump will have uh, any sort of impact on my race, it'll, it'll be to show that my opponent is not all that different from those policies. My opponent is pro-ICE. My opponent, I can paint, a, I can tell you a lot of different issues on which my opponent is not all that different from Trump. I'm actually the, you know, today we don't really have two parties. We have one party, which is the business party. And both Republican and Democratic parts pay homage to the business party. And the same is true with my opponent. I'm really fighting for the grassroots, for the working class people who live in my district. My opponent certainly is not. But Mr. Trump is claiming some uh, historical figures. He says there's a the lowest uh, uh, minority uh, unemployment rate so far, <laughs> lowest African American unemployment rate sure. so far, lowest Hispanic American uh, unemployment rate so far. Uh -huh. Don't you think that would have an impact on? Well, you know, I, I, I love when those statistics come up because my question is then what has Trump done to make those things happen? What has he done? You know, he's benefiting from trends that go back 20, 30 years. So Trump it has done nothing. If anything, Trump is lucky that these numbers look as good as they are because with his trade tax that he's imposed on consumers, those numbers could be a lot higher. With his instability in the markets, which he's a very unstable actor in the market, he's lucky to be benefiting from this. It really just shows the fact that these numbers are so low just goes to show the strength of the Obama rally and and the great effect. You know, when Obama was president, I would hear so much, he's destroying the economy, he's the worst economic president ever, how could he be doing this? And But look at the trend lines. Donald Trump has created less jobs in his first three years in office than Barack Obama created in his last three years. So in fact, Barack Obama was a better jobs president than Donald Trump has been. So. I, I always like to ask, yeah, okay, sure, those numbers are what you say they are. What has Trump done to precipice those numbers? And how come stock market is, is responding uh, in his favor? The stock market has been on an upward trend for a long time, since the Obama years. So again, it, it's the same thing. What has Trump done to get those numbers there? In fact, I would say that he's done a lot of things. It could be a lot better if Trump was a more stable, a better, it, you know, I love that the Republicans love to always hit the Democrats with socialism and say, you're socialist. Donald Trump is the biggest socialist in America. His policies are Soviet-style economic central planning. When you look at the farmer subsidy, that's robbing Peter to pay Paul. He creates a, he's got a trade tax, which is what we don't talk about, the tariffs, which are a tax on consumers. The fact of the matter is the economy could be doing a lot better if Donald Trump was a more stable, free market uh, advocate like he pretends to be. Donald Trump is the biggest socialist in American politics today. What do you think about the USMCA uh, deal? And it, it's a NAFTA part two. It, you know, it's, Trump would love to act like it's an improvement. It's not really much of an improvement. Um, it's, it follows would it, would from, it not bring in more jobs uh, for Americans? And doubtful. Uh, and manufacturing is on a downward slope even during the Trump years. Manufacturing is at its lowest ever. So Donald Trump has not been uh, this savior of the economy like a lot of his supporters would claim him to be. He's really benefiting from the trends that Obama put in over eight years. Okay, let's talk about foreign policy. Great. What, what do you think, uh, since you're running for Congress, yeah. uh, what do you think are some of our most pressing issues in terms of foreign policy. Wonderful. So the rise of China and Russia, if you're talking about militarily, because again, this president has been so erratic in his behavior that he's empowered our greatest geopolitical threats, which are Russia and China, the only two larger, you know, you could say empires on the global stage. Uh, China has become very belligerent ever since Donald Trump got into office. 
Russia has remained belligerent, has been belligerent for a long time, yeah. but if anything, has become emboldened because they see weakness from this president. But one of our greatest uh, foreign policy threats, and it's something that is a global issue and that we will have to mobilize the world to tackle, is the issue of climate change. Climate change is something that's going to affect every nation on this planet. And it is going to be an international uh, crisis when the sea levels start to rise. And you think immigration is bad now. What happens when the global refugees start coming because of climate migration? So I really, and the Pentagon would agree with me, climate change is one of our greatest foreign policy uh, challenges. And it's something that we have to do something strongly about now. And it's something that the current administration really doesn't take seriously. So we shouldn't have pulled out of the deal. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Ter it, it was, t you know, you could criticize that deal for many uh, on many different aspects, but staying in it would have been much better than pulling out of it. Because at least if we would have stayed in that deal, we could have built upon what was necessary to accomplish. Right? Uh, you don't make the good the enemy of the perfect. You know, you should have built upon an acceptable infrastructure than pulling out and not doing anything because now we're in a worse position. As part of your campaign, what are some of the core issues you're focusing on? So my greatest issue is anti-corruption okay. because it's something that is very pressing. It's our biggest hitter when we talk to people. Everybody knows that there's a lot of corruption going on through the establishment Democratic Party, the uh, Hudson County uh, Democratic Organization, and a lot of the other Democratic organizations are currently now engaged in a corrupt scheme to bracket the presidential candidates off from down ballot candidates like myself because they're afraid of the energy that we're building and of us lining up with a progressive presidential candidate. So corruption is one of the biggest themes I'm hoping to hit on this uh, campaign trail, but also affordable housing because anywhere you live in New Jersey, you recognize that it's not easy to find rent and it's not easy to rent um, at an acceptable rate. And this is something that's been going on for a long time. It's something I actually tie back to the corruption issue because the reason our rents are so high is because the polit politicians are bought off by the real estate developers, the high-end developers who come in, the Jared Kushners who come to Jersey City, put up a development. You know, I'm an attorney, so I should be earning the big bucks, so to speak. Those developments that are going up, I could never afford to live in. Nobody who lives in our district could afford to live in them. So affordable housing is one of the major issues that uh, we're fighting for. This week, we just put out our affordable housing policy, touching upon all the major components that we would have to see to make our district affordable to the people who live there. So what are your plans now? How, how is the campaign going? Did you, 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 you kick-started a campaign already? Yeah, absolutely. We've been going strong um, since last November. Uh, things have been going really, really well. Um, we're canvassing every single week. We're calling, text banking, we're holding events. Uh, we're really getting us, ourselves yep. engaged. Yeah, how's the response so far? Amazing, amazing. Pe like I said, people have been so uh, sick of business as usual, they are happy to just have a choice. For so long in American politics, right, you're told that America, this is the land of choices, you, you can choose whatever you want, right? But when it comes to our politics, your only options were Pepsi and Coke. Yep. That's all you had to choose from. And most, and because we're a blue state, your Pepsi was only Pepsi for so long. You don't have another choice. A lot of our politicians run unopposed. So just the fact that the voters will see another name on their ballot is very exciting to a lot of them. People are happy to have a primary challenger and they're very excited to be able to vote for somebody else. You, you don't know how far that goes. Just the fact that you can vote for somebody else. So any closing comments to our voters? Why Hector? Yeah, uh, why Hector? If you believe that corruption is a problem, if you believe that New Jersey is an unaffordable state to live in, if you believe that we can do better and that you deserve better, I encourage you to go to my website, osegera2020.com. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Sign up to volunteer. If you can, chip in a few dollars. It's very expensive to run these campaigns. And like I said, I'm not relying on the corruption. I'm not relying, I don't take any PAC money. People who donate to this campaign hear my message and they believe in what we're doing. So if you can, go to my website, osegera2020.com. 
sign up to volunteer, donate if you can, and get yourself involved because this is going to be a tremendous year for our district and you want to be a part of it. Well, Hector, it was a pleasure. Uh, on behalf of Mana TV, wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. Well, viewers, that is all the show for tonight. Until next week, take care. God bless America.